One of the titles of Jesus that many people are familiar with is the title of the Good Shepherd. There have been countless sermons preached about this title, numerous studies done about this title, usually in connection with the parable of the lost sheep. And we make an assumption, we assume that everyone understands the meaning of the title, the Good Shepherd. But it's actually striking how many people have a different view of God. Many people have their own preconceived ideas about his character, about his behavior, that really aren't that good, even by lower worldly standards. What I mean by that is there are a lot of people who have a view of God, his nature, his character, that are actually less than good. I've heard it many times where people have told me that they view a God, but their view of God is not of a good shepherd, not of a shepherd who loves and cares for a sheep, but instead they expect and they see a shepherd who abuses his sheep, who sometimes refuses to care for his sheep, who sometimes puts sickness and disease on his sheep and causes his sheep to suffer. That is their view of God. And even by worldly standards, even by our own thinking and our reasoning, that isn't good. If we would treat other people the way that we expect God to treat us, we would not be considered good. If you saw someone treating somebody else the way that we often expect God to treat us, it would be just as wrong. So today I want to encourage you with this study about how your good shepherd is really good. And by the end of it, you will have a view of God, not as the common shepherd that we think of him as, not as the abusive shepherd, but you will see him as he describes himself in the scriptures. And you will have a proper foundation to see God as your good shepherd. Welcome to Thriving Branch. I'm Jim. Today we are taking a look at Jesus being our Good Shepherd. Not just a shepherd, but the Good Shepherd. You know, it's no accident that his title is the Good Shepherd, not simply a shepherd. Every little detail in the Bible is important. And you might say, why is it so important? that I understand that Jesus is my good shepherd. Why is that important? Well, it's important precisely because, first of all, he went through great pains to show you that he is the good shepherd. And second of all, if you don't see him as a good shepherd, if you see him as a bad shepherd that abuses his sheep, or gets angry at his sheep, or punishes his sheep, then there are many things that you will not be able to approach him about. Because you'll be afraid. You won't have the confidence to approach him that he will give you a solution. Instead, you'll be afraid to approach him at all. And when you do approach him, you won't be approaching him in confidence. You'll be approaching him in fear. You'll be approaching him in terror. You won't be able to be open with him. And the first scripture that we're going to read today is going to be John chapter 10, verses 10 and 11. Because while it may seem simple, it carries with it a very important truth about the difference between a let's say, bad shepherd, and Jesus himself. 
And I want you to see this because it contrasts Jesus with the enemy. There are many people who place themselves under the care of bad shepherds. And they all have one source. Let's read John chapter 10, verses 10 and 11. It's always important that you read in your own Bible whenever you can. Because I don't want you to just take my word about anything. I want you to see it in the scripture for yourself. John chapter 10, verses 10 and 11. Let's read it together. Ready? One, two, read. The thief comes not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Take a moment. Just meditate on what these verses are saying. There is one who comes to steal and to kill and to destroy, but it is not God. God is not the one who takes away your treasure. God is not the one who kills. God is not the one who destroys. He doesn't take away what you hold dear. That characteristic belongs to the thief that is the enemy. Many people attribute these attributes to God. They say, God took this away. God killed this person. God destroyed everything. They claim that he's the one taking away good things from them. Killing their loved ones. Destroying things or lands or people. Many times when there's an earthquake or a natural disaster, they call it an act of God. God is the one who creates life. God isn't the one who destroys. And that's why these two verses are so important. Because they tell us the real truth. The real character of God and the real source of stealing and killing and destroying. Not God. God is not the thief. God is not the murderer. God is not the destroyer. The enemy is. In contrast, look at the true character of God. Jesus says, He has come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. The they being spoken of here are his sheep. His sheep are the ones who receive salvation. Jesus came to give life, not take it away. And not only has he come to give life, but to give it abundantly, more abundantly. That's an overflow of rich and wonderful life. Not a barely scraped by life, not a meager life of less than his best, but he wants you to have every promise, every blessing, absolutely everything which he has paid for you to have. And he wants you to have so very much of it that there is plenty left over to spare and to share. You know, you, we often say it this way, you're blessed to be a blessing. That's true. He wants you to have an overabundance so that not only can you live and thrive with it, but you can comfortably share with others. To share in his goodness, to share in his blessings, to share his grace. This is the God of overabundance. This is who God is. This is his character. He is the ultimate provider. He is the creator of the entire universe that we're talking about here. <laughs> Let these verses speak to you about his goodness, his provision, his amazing generosity. God isn't stingy. He gives you everything in abundance. And all of that was verse 10. Verse 11 gives you the foundation. The reason why verse 10 is true is found in verse 11 and why you can trust it completely. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. You see, 
In contrast to the thief, which kills and destroys life, the good shepherd actually gives his own life so that the sheep will be spared and have life. Has that happened? Well, look a few verses down to verse 15. Verse 15 says, As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Also, verses 17 and 18 say, Therefore does my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Jesus' entire purpose for coming down to this earth as a man was to give his very life for ours. That was his purpose. He came to give his life so that we would be spared, that we would be completely loosed from the bondage of the enemy and the thieving and the killing and the destroying that the enemy does. Furthermore, we can see that he did this willingly. No one ever had the power to take Jesus' life from him. Instead, he willingly laid it down. He laid down his life of his own accord, a divine act of pure love and goodness and care for us. And it doesn't even stop here. In verse 18, we see that Jesus received this divine order, this directive from the Father. Why is this important? Why is this important for us to know? Because it tells us that all of the love and the goodness and the care that Jesus displayed by giving his very life for us is actually shared by the Father in heaven as well. Some people have this idea that Jesus is nice and gentle and the Father is mean and vicious. But these verses destroy that false idea. Jesus is not the nice one while the Father is the mean one. No, they both divinely love us equally. And as Hebrews chapter 10 verses 6 through 10 makes clear, it was the very will of the Father that Jesus should fulfill and remove the Old Covenant and usher us into the New Covenant so that we would be under that grace again, all based on love. Now, in light of this, I want to pose a question that all of us should consider. Since Jesus paid such a very high price to totally redeem us, to move us into a totally new covenant to restore our created value and make us completely new creations in him, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, and also to give us his abundant life and remove the bondage and the effects of the thief, as we read here, in light of all that, why is it that so many people still assume that God himself treats them as the enemy would? That's the question. Why is it, in light of what we know, in light of what we read here, why is it that so many people still assume that God himself treats us as the enemy would? Why is it that so many attribute the effects of the enemy in their life to God? Why is it that we immediately assume God is the one taking things away and stealing and killing and destroying? Why do they say, oh, this is just God's will for me? I can't even convey to you how many conversations I've had with people who just casually tell me that God is the one taking provisions away from them or that God took their loved ones from them, or even destroyed this or that, or that it's God's will for them to suffer. Why do we think that way? 
Why do we refuse to believe the truth about the character of God? The truth of his goodness, the truth of his care, the truth of his provision and his mercy. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4 tells us that it is the God of this age, that's small g God and that's Satan, the God of this age, and notice that he's confined to one age. His rule is very short. Who has blinded the eyes of people so that they might not see the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. And as we've studied before, he uses his one and only weapon to do it. Lies. You see, Satan really only has one weapon. Deception. Falsehood lies. That's what he does. He will lie to you. And if you believe his lies, then he can steal from you. And if you let him steal enough, he will kill. That's how he works. But it all begins with lies. Satan must attempt to blind the eyes of people. Because if they truly see how great the gospel really is, it's already too late for him. So he lies to people. He tells them, God really isn't a nice guy. God really isn't good. Or that God really doesn't heal or provide or bless. He tells them that God is a judgmental, stingy withholder. Even though the reality is that God gave everything even the life of Jesus himself, so that we would be spared. The enemy will literally say anything to keep people blind, to keep them in the dark regarding who God really is, because he knows that the moment anyone honestly approaches God, it's over. It's the same lie from the Garden of Eden. The exact same lie from the beginning in the Garden of Eden is what he tricks people with today. The very lie from the Garden of Eden was, did God really say, God is a withholder. God doesn't want you to be like him. So he's telling you, you can't have that. God is withholding from you. And Adam and Eve bought into that lie. And they lost what they already had because God wasn't really withholding anything. They already had it. They lost it when they lost their perspective of God. It's the exact same lie today. God really isn't good. God is withholding from you. And it's all designed to keep you from coming to God. To put a wedge in between that relationship that Jesus actually bridged. As we close today, I want to address one of the biggest lies, specifically about the Good Shepherd. It's often told to people about the parable of the lost sheep. It's found in Luke chapter 15, verses 3 through 6. I want you to read this with me, if you can. Luke chapter 15, verses 3 through 6. Ready? One, two, read. And he spoke this parable to them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness, and go after that one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Now you've probably heard, as I have many times before, one particular lie about this parable that's very widespread, 
Many people accept it to be true simply because it's repeated so often. This lie has been repeated again and again and again so much that people just automatically believe it's true without checking it for themselves. This lie is that the shepherd would break the leg of a stray sheep to keep it from wandering anymore after he found it. This lie has seemingly captivated the minds and thoughts of many people and caused them to see their God, to see their good shepherd, as someone who would break their legs if they happen to take the wrong path or make the wrong choice. I've seen people going through terrible pain and not accepting deliverance offered by Jesus because they are so deceived that they believe he is the one inflicting it. And this is kind of what I mentioned in the opening. If you see God as the source of your problem, if you see God as the one inflicting you with the suffering, you will never honestly approach him for deliverance. You see? Well, allow me to expose this lie today with the truth of Jesus Christ. Because not only would a Hebrew shepherd, especially a Hebrew shepherd under the law of Moses, he would never break the leg of a sheep. Not only would he never break the leg of a sheep, but it doesn't even fit with the parable being told here by Jesus. Let's consider this together with a fresh perspective in the light of Christ. The shepherd does not break the sheep's legs. We don't even see that in this text at all. First, what we do see is that the shepherd carries it on his shoulders rejoicing, which would be demented if he had just purposefully injured it. Can you even imagine the picture if he did break the leg of the sheep? Imagine the shepherd finding his lost sheep, which is already scared from being lost. It sees the shepherd coming towards it. The sheep is happy to see the shepherd coming near, and when the shepherd lays his hands on the sheep, he snaps the legs of the, and cries out in pain and agony. And then the shepherd picks it up and rejoices. That's a sick, twisted picture of cruelty and abuse. It's not a picture of a loving, good shepherd. The sheep's crying out in pain while the shepherd is rejoicing. What's that? That's a pretty sick picture. Thankfully, we don't see that in this text. We don't see any leg breaking going on here. Jesus doesn't even mention anything like that. Where did it come from? Hmm, it's a good question. Maybe it's a lie from the enemy designed to put a barrier between you and God that isn't really there. The only thing we see here is care and joyful rejoicing about recovering the lost sheep. And second, it's very important to understand this story from a Hebrew perspective. A Jewish shepherd, under the law of Moses, would never break a sheep's leg or harm it in any way, because as we know from the law, the moment a sheep becomes blemished, it becomes useless. Not only would a shepherd never harm a sheep, but there were many ways to keep a sheep near the flock without physically causing it pain. They might tie a sheep to other sheep, or they might tie the sheep to themselves. They might assign a dog to watch a particular sheep. They might even tie a weight to the sheep's leg. But they would never, never would a good shepherd break the leg of a sheep. So, my dear friend, let the lie of Jesus breaking sheep's legs be removed from your mind. It's not true. Instead, hear the parable of Jesus as he actually told it. 
because it's all about rejoicing. It's all about finding the lost sheep and rejoicing. He's not carrying it on his shoulders because he it has broken legs. He's carrying it to show that he's the one bringing it back. The burden is on his shoulders, not on the sheep. That's why he's carrying it. The sheep can sense to be carried by the loving good shepherd. And it's a time of rejoicing, not pain. There are many people suffering because of this lie, and they're suffering needlessly. They need to learn this parable as it's actually told by Jesus, and let Jesus carry them. And let it be a time of rejoicing. The shepherd has come. You don't have to carry your burden anymore. Let him carry you. I encourage you today. The Good Shepherd is really good. Be blessed.